Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. We need to prepare the soil for just a moment here. Anybody know how to pray? Could you lift up your voice and just call on the name of Jesus right now? I think we need to push past exhaustion. I think we need to push past distractions right now. And I think we need to enter into the presence of the Lord. God, I pray right now, speak to your people, Lord. Minister to your saints tonight, I pray. Let the word be alive to us. Let it be real. Let it be relevant to us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. First Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19 and verse number 1. And we'll read five verses together. Uh, I, I really wrestled with what particular text to read tonight because I could have read from several places to preach this sermon. And uh, I risk by reading this passage, uh, I risk causing you to think from the beginning that I'm going to be uh, depressing tonight and it's not my intention to preach a depressing sermon by any stretch of the imagination. I do plan to preach faith tonight. But I believe that we need to begin in the low point of Elijah's ministry and see what was happening in his life and how he overcame it. First Kings 19 and 1. If you have that, say amen. amen. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. To me, this is one of the most perplexing passages of Scripture in your entire Bible one of the most perplexing passages of Scripture in your entire Bible, and I'll explain to you why I believe that is so. And tonight I'm preaching defeating the demon behind the demon. Defeating the demon behind the demon. Put your Bibles down and lift up your hands, and let's ask the Lord to help us, shall we? Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I feel a heaviness in my spirit tonight. I, I feel as though I am wrestling against a principality even as I pray, Lord. And I come against it in the name of Jesus. I come against every complacent spirit right now. I come against every carnal fleshly spirit in the name of Jesus. I come against every lustful spirit that would dare to walk through the doors of this church. And I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And I pray that there would be godly authority, Lord, and righteous power that would permeate this atmosphere tonight. I give you praise. I give you glory. In the name of Jesus. And someone ought to call on the name of Jesus because there is a spiritual warfare taking place. And if you can't feel it, it's because you're not plugged in to what God is doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Elijah was the first in a long line of prophets to Israel. And as pastor preached uh, for a while on Elijah, I don't want to preach over anything that, that he mentioned, but we should remember that 
Uh, Israel and Judah were split into two separate nations with two separate kings. And Israel went 300 years without one single godly king. Israel had become wicked. It had become idolatrous. And so God raised up prophets. The first and perhaps the greatest was Elijah, the first of 300 years of prophets who spoke into idolatry, who preached into carnality, who risked their lives to tell the truth about God's word. They spoke truth to power. They spoke truth when it was difficult. They spoke truth when it was unpopular. They spoke truth when people laughed at them. They spoke truth when people tried to kill them. They simply did what God called them to do. And Elijah was a true man of God in every sense of the phrase. He was committed to having a relationship with God. In the very first chapter that introduces Elijah in 1 Kings, it says that he was a man who knew God. And that was the great miracle of Elijah beyond all of the manifestations and the miracles that came out of Elijah's ministry. You've got to remember that it started because he was a man who knew God. And if you want to see miracles in your life, you've got to know who God is. If you want the touch of God in your life, you're going to have to know who God is. If you want to see signs and wonders, you're going to have to know who God is for yourself. Grandma's relationship with God is not going to cut it for you. Grandpa's relationship with God is not going to move you forward. You have to know who God is for yourself. Amen. Let me just preach to this church for a moment. Sister Cole's prayer is not going to be enough for you. You're going to have to learn how to pray. Sister Cole's worship is not going to make it for you. You've got to learn how to worship. Pastor's anointing is not going to make it for you. You've got to have an anointing. Yes. You've got to know who God is for yourself. And Elijah knew God, and he walked with God, and he was called into an incredibly difficult time and season in the history of Israel. During Elijah's time, the king was named Ahab. Most of us are familiar with him. The Bible described him as the most wicked of all the kings. I'm going to tell you. Israel had some dirty, low-down, wicked kings. So it's really saying a lot if, if Ahab was the worst of them. One of the things among many that made Ahab a terrible king is that he married a pagan woman. And this pagan woman's name was Jezebel. She was a worshiper of the false god Baal. I considered describing to you what Baal worship was like. Uh, But I know that there's children here tonight, and so I want to be careful. But needless to say, the worship of Baal included all kinds of perversion. It included violence, it included sexual perversion, and it included a lifestyle and a mindset that was warped and degenerate, to say the least. And the worship of Baal became the sanctioned religion of Israel. In fact, it was Ahab and Jezebel who killed many of the righteous leaders in Israel. And they set up temples and idols to Baal. And it was a stench in the nostrils of God. This was the time period that Elijah was called into ministry. And can I tell you, there's some seasons where it's better to be a minister than other seasons. And Elijah was called to be a minister in a very difficult season. And one of the first things that God called Elijah to do was to pray for the heavens to be closed and for there to be a drought. And Elijah prayed and God closed up the heavens and the rains did not come. The dew did not come. It was so dry that it was a literal disaster in the kingdom of Israel. And the reason for this was because Baal worshipers believed that Baal was the God who brought the rains and he brought the harvest. 
And so when God said, I want you to pray for the heavens to be closed, God was literally shaking his fist in the face of idol worship. God was saying, you want to pray to a God that you believe sends rain and harvest? I'll show you who the one true living God is. If you think you can dance around Baal idols and think the rain's going to fall, you've got another thing coming. Because I am the God who flung the stars in the space. I'm the God who poured out the oceans. I alone caused the rain to fall. I alone caused the dew to rise up in the early morning hours. And God shut the heavens for three years. Nothing came. And the people knew that something spiritual was happening. This angered Ahab so greatly that he was searching all over for Elijah. Elijah had to go into hiding. And you know the story. And eventually when that ended, that three-year drought where God had proved himself mighty before the entire nation of Israel, after all of that time, Elijah finally realized under the unction of God that it was time to face wicked King Ahab face to face. And so Elijah decided to go into the very mouth of the lion and look King Ahab in the eye. And challenge him to the great duel that we know of on Mount Carmel. Where Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal and Ahab to worship their God. And put a sacrifice before Baal. And ask for the heavens to be opened with rain. And the prophets of Baal, as you know because we've preached it a thousand times. They danced and they raved, the Bible says, around that idol and around that sacrifice. They shouted, they foamed, they cut themselves, they gyrated. And they were asking for Baal to send the rain and show himself powerful. And of course we know that the rain did not come because there's no God named Baal. The only God is the one true living God, Jehovah Jireh, the provider. And so the heavens remained silent until they could not dance any longer. Their strength was gone. And Elijah, of course, prayed one simple prayer of sacrifice. And God split the heavens with fire. And he consumed the sacrifice. And he made himself known in that moment. And Elijah immediately had the prophets of Baal killed in the brook. And he ran because he knew that the sound of the abundance of rain was coming. Ahab was running back to the city and running back to the palace. And Elijah overtook him. And in that moment, it seemed as if it was the greatest victory that the prophet had ever seen and ever known. Can you imagine as apostolics if we stood out on Terra Boulevard and we challenged in front of the news cameras and we challenged in front of reporters and in front of every false prophet in the region of Metro Atlanta and we said, you go ahead and pray your prayer and see if God responds and then we'll pray our prayer as apostolics and see if God responds. Can you imagine the excitement if God sent fire from heaven that consumed the sacrifice and made himself known right in the middle of Atlanta. It would make local news, national news, international news. People would be writing books about it, telling stories about it, thinking about it, wondering about it because it was such a powerful display of God's might. And in the midst of all of that, the rain is coming after a three-year drought And then the man of God receives the news that Jezebel is coming to kill him. And in one of the most interesting passages of scripture, we see that Elijah, that great prophet of faith, goes from the mountaintop literally with the power of God falling as fire to now he is running for his life. Because he finds that the queen of Israel, who is nothing but a pagan prophetess, is looking to kill him. And that great preacher is now wondering if it would be better for him to die. How do you get to that place? I've thought of this often because we see it in our own spiritual lives. How many could testify that you have gone from a great spiritual experience to one of your greatest moments of depression? 
How many could recognize that there have been times where you have left the altar of power only to walk into the valley of pain? How many could testify that you have left the mountaintop of joy unspeakable and full of glory only to step into the valley of the shadow of death? That's where Elijah was and the question that we ask ourselves in those moments and the question that I ask to myself of Elijah is how could someone's faith go from calling down fire from heaven to now they are contemplating their own death? How does this happen? How does it happen in our lives? And certainly how could it happen in the life of someone the caliber and the anointing of Elijah And I have asked myself this question many, many times. And I believe the Lord gave me an answer. And I believe he revealed it to me. I believe that Elijah in the early part of his ministry. And here's where I'm going to give you my opinion for a moment here. In the early part of Elijah's ministry, he recognized that the power center was with the king. Elijah looked and he knew that Ahab was influenced and that he was married to a pagan woman. He knew that Jezebel was a wicked influence. But I believe that Elijah made the mistake of believing that Ahab was the source of the power. I believe that Elijah looked at Ahab and believed that if he could simply defeat Ahab, that he would have won the final battle for Israel. I believe that Elijah felt as though if he could turn the heart of Ahab back to God or at least prove to Ahab that God was the one true living God, that Ahab would back off or perhaps even repent or change and then everything would be fine because he was identifying the main enemy as Ahab. Ahab was indeed an enemy of God's people. Ahab was certainly wicked, but Ahab was a lesser demon. And I believe that the spirits that were behind Ahab and the spirit that was behind Jezebel lives on today. Jezebel is dead and Ahab is dead, but the spirits that influence them in that region are alive and well today. Spirits don't die and demons don't die. Just the vessels that they're used by die. And so... I believe the spirit of Ahab is alive and the spirit of Jezebel is alive and it is still in operation. In fact, I can feel this church wrestling against those very same spirits right now in this service. I sense it in the Atlanta metro area. It is a spirit that is strong. The Ahab spirit is a dangerous spirit because it is weak. An Ahab spirit is dangerous because... It is willing to be used by a more dangerous spirit. An Ahab spirit is not able to truly think for itself. An Ahab spirit does not truly make the decisions. It appears as though it does because Ahab seems to have power. Ahab seems to have influence. But in reality, there is a stronger demon influencing Ahab behind the scenes. Ahab was nothing but a puppet. And Jezebel was the puppet master. The real spirit that was influencing the region was the spirit of Jezebel. We might know it by different names and it might reveal itself by different terms throughout the years. But in that moment, it identified itself as the spirit of Jezebel. Jezebel was a vindictive, powerful, murderous, demonic spirit that hated holiness, that hated the people of God, that hated the preaching of the word, that hated the man of God, hated the temple of God, and hated the things of God. And yet she wanted to incorporate herself in to the places that were supposed to be the holy places. And so Jezebel was busy infiltrating the castle infiltrating the king so that she could gain influence and impact the people of God. And I want you to know that the church needs to rise up against the spirit of Ahab and against the spirit of Jezebel. And we need to rebuke it and say, you're not welcome at Apostolic Tabernacle. You're not welcome in my home. You're not welcome on my tablet, on my screen, on my phone. I am not going to allow the spirit that hates holiness. I am not going to allow a spirit that hates praise. I'm not going to allow a spirit that hates worship. 
I'm not going to allow a spirit that hates preaching anywhere near my home, anywhere near my church, or anywhere near my family. And so Elijah, when he got the victory over Ahab, I want you to notice that Ahab had plenty of face-to-face -face meetings with Elijah, and he had plenty of opportunities to have Elijah killed, but he did not have the guts to do it. The Ahab spirit wasn't man enough to stand up to the man of God. Ahab was intimidated by Elijah. Ahab talked a good game and he said all the right things that sounded a little scary. But in the end, Ahab wasn't going to do anything against Elijah. But when Elijah obtained victory over Ahab, he thought that was the moment. And then he received word that Jezebel was coming and he realized, I believe, that there was a greater spirit behind the spirit that he had been fighting. There was something behind the scenes. There was a demon behind the demon. I felt the Lord speak to me very clearly in prayer this afternoon that there are people in this room who wonder why after you get a great victory in the Holy Ghost, you go right back. And face things that you did not think you would have to face again. And I've got a word from you in the Holy Ghost right now. The reason is because you defeated a lesser demon that was sent to distract you from the real demon that is trying to gain influence in your life. And you don't even recognize that you have only defeated a puppet. But the puppet master is behind the scenes trying to gain influence on your mind. Trying to hinder your praise. Trying to hold back your prayer. That's why some of you can't even open up your mouth and call on the name of Jesus tonight. And you're wondering why. I got, I got power over Ahab. You better recognize there is a stronger spirit that is trying to grip you even as I'm preaching this message. It's a spirit that's hard to identify. It's a spirit that cloaks itself in beauty and seduction. It's a spirit that hides its true identity behind masks and veils. It's a spirit that is the master of disguise. And that is why the church takes a stand, among many other reasons, for altering our God-given appearance. Because God made you beautiful. God made you special. God wants you to be who he designed you to be. We are not called to be like the enemy of our soul. Constantly walking in masks and disguises. Constantly altering who we are and what God made us to be. That's the spirit of Jezebel that says I can look like this one day And I can look like that tomorrow Because I'm going to change God's design Because I'm not even serving the real God No, we're the people of God We walk in the beauty of holiness We walk in the design that God gave us Because God does not make mistakes I said God does not make mistakes And so Elijah realized, being the great prophet that he was, there's a spirit that I knew it was there. I sensed it. He knew who Jezebel was, but he didn't realize the influence and the power that Jezebel truly had. And in that moment after that great victory, it dawned on Elijah as he ran for his life. I have been focused on this great battle on the mountain. And I thought it was the war to win all wars. I thought it was the battle to win all battles. And in reality, it's just getting started. Because I thought it was Ahab and Ahab's nothing. He's just a wimpy old coward hiding over there in a corner. But there's a spirit that is coming against me right now. And when Elijah recognized the power and the authority of that pagan spirit he literally could barely walk and let's face it there are moments in our lives as we walk with God when we wonder if we can just put one foot in front of the other. That's why my Bible says walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. There are some times when it's hard for us to even get up. That's why my Bible says stand. And when you've done all you can do to stand, stand. Therefore, having yourself gird with the full armor of God. 
And so, if you want to know how to defeat the spirit behind the spirit, if you want to know how to gain victory over the demon behind the demon, and God is giving somebody tonight a revelation that the reason you don't have victory in your life is because there are unidentified spirits attacking you on a daily basis, and you've been distracted by Ahab when it's really Jezebel that you need to deal with. And somebody better go ahead and get in an altar tonight and make sure that you can do what it takes to get victory over the demon behind the demon. The first thing that Elijah had to overcome when he was on the road to defeating this demon, this greater force that he had not even fully realized, is an angel of the Lord came to him in his despair when he was lying down and he could barely move, contemplating death and suicide. And the angel tapped him on the shoulder and the angel said very simply to him, Get up! And I'm preaching to somebody tonight, you can barely lift your hands, you can barely stand, you can barely shout. Some of you can't even move out of the aisles because you're so bound by spirits attacking you. I'm telling you what you need to do in the spirit. Get up, get up, get up, get up. When you don't feel like standing, stand. When you don't feel like worshiping, worship. When you don't feel like eating, go ahead and get the bread in your life. When you don't feel like it, get up and be fed somebody worship the Lord somebody open up your mouth and give God praise right now I know you don't feel like it Elijah but open up your mouth I know you don't feel like standing up Elijah but get up anyway it's the first step on the journey to victory you will not get the victory just sitting there. You will not get the victory just being quiet. You will not get the victory just standing around. You're going to have to get up. You're going to have to take some authority. You're going to have to find some initiative. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. I'm calling a worshiper to get up. I'm calling a prayer warrior to get up. I'm calling a faster to get up. I'm calling a backslider to get up. But I don't feel anything, preacher. It doesn't matter. The angel's tapping you on the shoulder, telling you to get up. I know your flesh is telling you to be quiet. I know your flesh is telling you to sit down. I know your flesh tells you not to dance. I know your flesh tells you not to shout. I know your flesh tells you that running the aisles is old fashioned. I know your flesh tells you that people will make fun of you. But the angel is trying to get you to get up tonight so that you can find victory over the demon behind the demon. Just because you defeated Ahab, sir, doesn't mean you can defeat Jezebel just lying down. Oh, I'm battling a spirit right now. We need to pray. I need a prayer warrior who knows how to pray in the spirit. Somebody ought to talk in tongues right now. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Get up, get up. My God, my God, my God. Listen to this preacher. Listen to this preacher. I'm just going to preach it like I feel it, and you can accuse me of being a fear monger, whatever you want to do. But we have the Super Bowl coming next Sunday. Do you hate sports, Brother Ryan? No, I don't hate sports. But I'm going to tell you, this is a, a fact. The Super Bowl brings with it all kinds of human trafficking. Look it up. It's true. I'm not making this up. There's abductions. There's going to be abductions all over Atlanta during the Super Bowl. There are going to be people literally in slavery brought to Atlanta from all around the world. For wealthy people who fly in from all over the world to the Super Bowl. Do you know what that is? It is the spirit of Jezebel. Hear this preacher. It's a spirit of promiscuity. It's a spirit of lustfulness. It's a spirit of rage. It's a spirit of hatred. And it hates the church. And this church cannot play games when those kind of spirits come to town. 
Those spirits are already here. Atlanta is already the hub. You say, but Brother Ryan, what is the spirit of Jezebel? I'll tell you what I believe. I believe the spirit of Jezebel is the same spirit from Revelation chapter 17 and 18, that great mystery harlot that comes from Babylon, that great mother of harlots that comes up. It is the spirit of the last days. I believe that Babylon is the United States. You can talk to me about it later. And I want you to know we are living right in the midst of the last push of the spirit of Jezebel in the last days. You wonder why we're facing things? we never thought we could face do you wonder why little boys don't know if they're really boys it's the spirit of Jezebel that is trying to destroy young men it's trying to take masculinity away from men the spirit of Jezebel says you can't be a man you've got to be something else I rebuke it God has called you to be a man God has called you to be a man God has called you to be a man God has called you to be a woman worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness worship the Lord in the beauty of being a godly man who lifts up holy hands without wrath or doubting it is time for the church to recognize that God created us in his image with distinctions why because there's a holy purpose behind it we are a representation of the church and when you worship God as a man you honor God and when you worship God as a lady you honor God in your own way it's time for the church to say we're going to stand up for what God called us to be I'm not going to to dress like a woman I'm not going to walk like a woman I'm not going to talk like a woman I wish I could contrast the spirit of Esther with the spirit of Jezebel but I don't have time for that if you're wondering how not to be Jezebel you need to study Esther and Ruth everybody okay you can be seated I'm almost done Spirit is coming in the last days. It's a spirit that is trying to take over. You cannot defeat Jezebel the way you tried to defeat Ahab. Some of you have defeated some Ahabs, and so now you go through life trying to defeat the demon behind the demon the same way you defeated the lesser demon, and it will not work. You're not going to be able to do what you've always done and get what you've always gotten. The things that God calls you to do to overcome the weaker spirit of Ahab are going to be different than the levels of consecration that God calls you to to overcome the greater spirit of Jezebel. It's going to take a new level, a new dimension of faith. It's going to take a new commitment. That's why it's very dangerous the longer you live for God. If you're not careful, your prayer life will grow weaker rather than stronger. And the reality is the, the greater your relationship with God, the greater your anointing, the stronger the demon is that you're going to face. I'm not trying to be depressing, but I want you to understand that hell is not going to sit back silently as you grow in faith and power and anointing. If you think that hell is going to let you defeat Ahab and then say, oh, well, I guess we've lost. You've got another thing coming. You are going to graduate in the spirit from one dimension to the next. And you're going to have to go from the ability to overcome an Ahab to now moving to the ability to overcome a Jezebel. And it's going to take different things. And so if you lose your prayer, you won't even be able to overcome Ahab any longer. If you lose your praise, you won't even be able to go back and defeat that old demon that you defeated the first time you may have killed some Goliaths but if you lose your dance David you won't even be able to take a Goliath anymore so you've got to grow you've got to get up you've got to shake yourself from discouragement you have to shake yourself from the negative thoughts that come into your spirit that says I thought I'd already fought this battle God I don't want to have to fight it any longer the reality is you can have victory you can have authority and so the second thing that Elijah did that is powerful is he went into the presence of God on the mount what was Mount Sinai the very place that Moses received the Shekinah glory of God and he got in touch once again with the voice of God I'm preaching to somebody tonight who needs to get up and go to the mountain you're in a valley right now you are on a mountain but that mountain over there won't keep you tomorrow 
that mountain is not going to keep you from overcoming the spirit of Jezebel. Just because you had fire fall on Mount Carmel doesn't mean you're going to defeat Jezebel on that mountain. You're going to have to go to another mountain, sir. You're going to have to go back to the old mountain that Moses was at. You're going to have to get back to the place that grandma and grandpa first got the Holy Ghost. You're going to have to get back to the place where God first started dealing with your life. You're going to have to go back to some monuments. You're going to have to go back to some altars with tear stains. And you're going to have to say, Lord, I'm not leaving this place until I hear your voice afresh. Lord, I'm going to pray like grandma used to pray until you speak to me. Lord, I'm going to wrestle with you like Jacob did until you bless me. I'm not leaving until you touch me, God. Here's the danger of modern Pentecost. We used to pray for three hours in altars and now we pray for 30 minutes and think that's a long altar service. I'm not, I'm not bashing every church that only has one Sunday service, but our churches only want to have a th- one service a week sometimes and then we wonder, why is our power gone? Why are we weak? Because not only are we not doing what it takes to defeat Ahab, we have no power against Jezebel because our commitment is weakened. We won't get up and go back to the consecration that gave us victory in the first place. The second thing that God called Elijah to do, three things, and I'm not going to preach long. God said to Elijah, I want you to anoint and equip three people. And I also want you to know, Elijah, that much of your discouragement is because you have been fighting this battle by yourself for a long time. Hear this preacher. Much of your depression right now, Elijah, is because you think you're the only one serving God. You think you're the only person who's committed and you think you have to fight these battles all by yourself. And Elijah, I have not called you to fight this battle by yourself. And God spoke to Elijah. I hadn't noticed this till recently, but God called Elisha's name to Elijah. He said, I want you to go and find Elisha and anoint him to be your successor. I want you to go and search him out because there is someone who is going to be a strength to you. Someone who's going to walk with you and talk with you. Someone who will join forces with you. Someone who will praise with you. Someone who will pray with you. Someone who will have faith with you. And his name is Elisha. And I want you to go find him and join forces with him. And I'm preaching to somebody tonight. You cannot win this battle by yourself. You may have defeated Goliath by yourself. You may have defeated Ahab have by yourself but you are going to have to link up with men and women of God God said there are 7,000 believers hiding in caves right now that you know nothing about you need to connect with those people and know that my church my people are stronger than you think they are somebody tonight feels like you are all by yourself even though you're in a room surrounded with people who love God it's time for you to get up and recognize there are people who will bind with you against the enemy because the only way you're going to defend the spirit of Jezebel is to be plugged in with other people of faith link up with the right people and let me just preach to you for a moment you will never have victory over Jezebel if you're texting Jezebel Facebooking Jezebel watching Jezebel reading about Jezebel trying to look like Jezebel see some of you wonder why you can't get victory over this spirit but you read its magazines and you talk to its people and you go to its services and you think about its stuff it's time for you to get that out of your life and get with people who really love God it's time to find Elisha's it's time to find the 7,000 in the caves and say you're my people we're gonna bind together Against a spirit that seems absolutely impossible to defeat. There were two other people that God spoke to Elijah and said, I want you to anoint Elisha. He's going to be your replacement prophet. I also want you to anoint, and this is very strange, Haziel, king of Aram, who was a wicked enemy king. And God said, I want you to anoint this pagan king 
because he is going to be my arm of judgment on the wickedness of Jezebel. You're going to literally, listen to me, somebody needs to hear this. You are literally going to anoint that king to be my judgment against this king. Because God views a backslider in a very different way than he does someone who has always been a pagan. The judgment of God was coming to Ahab in a very different way than it would ever come to Hazael. Because God looks at those who know his goodness and turn their back on his goodness. He gives them every chance. He gave Ahab chance after chance after chance. And Ahab continued to be caught up in the spirit of Jezebel until finally God brought judgment from a pagan king. And secondly, God said, I want you to anoint Jehu as the future king of Israel. Jehu will be the one to bring internal judgment to Ahab and Jezebel. And so it's important to see that if you want to have victory, listen, almost everything that I just mentioned involves having victory over your relationships. Hello. You're going to have to bind together with men and women of faith. And you're going to have to say, I am going to be what God called me to be. And I'm going to stand back and let God fight my battles for me. Did anybody catch that? You might can face it. Ahab. Call down fire from heaven. And see Ahab run away to Jezebel in fear. But you're not going to defeat Jezebel by yourself. It's going to take an army of people with you. God using people that you wouldn't expect over here. People that you wouldn't expect over there. People that you didn't even know about over there. And you bind together and say, I'm going to walk in confidence that God is fighting my battles. And so, interestingly, Elijah never saw the death of Jezebel. Everybody okay? I'm almost done. It was 20 years after Elijah died that Jezebel was killed. It was Jehu, the one that he anointed, who had her killed. But Elijah was not there to see it happen. But what Elijah was allowed to do in the spirit was to create and set in motion a series of spiritual events that were so powerful and so God-ordained that those things played themselves out even after Elijah was dead. Did you know that Elijah is one of the amazing prophets because there were things that happened in his ministry even after his ministry was gone? And so Jezebel was killed after that. Jehu came, and of course Ahab was killed. And, uh, and when they came for Jezebel, the Bible says that Jehu was riding up on his horse and she saw him and the Bible says that in a display of, of literally vindictiveness and in defiance she put on her makeup her mascara she put on her wig to change her appearance she put on her adornment and her pagan garments and she stood up at the top of the tower and she looked down defiantly at Jehu who had been anointed by Elijah and she stood there literally in her last moments mocking the plan of God and Jehu didn't even have to kill her with his own hands she had some servants there and he said who will stand with me and the servants threw her from the tower and she died at the bottom of the tower they didn't even bother to pick her body up that's how far low she had fallen they went in to eat something and when they came back out Jehu said you know she she was royalty in a sense maybe we should bury her and when they went to bury her body all they found was her head her hands and her feet fulfilling the prophecy of old Jezebel was so wicked that the dogs couldn't even eat where she went, her feet, what she touched, her hands, and what she thought about her head. That was the wickedness of Jezebel. And she fell so low even after Elijah's death. I want to preach to somebody that God will always have the final say. God will always, always have the final say. In the meantime, while Jezebel was still alive, we fast forward and look at Elijah's life. 
going from running and hiding and contemplating suicide that just a few chapters later in 2 Kings, he's walking in holy confidence even though his enemy is still alive. And that's what somebody needs to understand tonight. You need to let God fight your battles and God will take care of Jezebel. You just need to be what God called you to be. Don't change who you are. You need to be holy. You need to be righteous. You need to be apostolic and stand still and let the Lord Lord, fight your battles. And so we see that Elijah is standing there and an army comes to him and they're calling on behalf of the king and they say, you've got to come down and go with us to the king right now. And the same Elijah who had been hiding in fear looked at them and said, if I be a man of God, let me call down fire from heaven right now to destroy you and your men. Don't take another step closer. Elijah refused to allow Jezebel To rob him of his spiritual authority and his anointing. Because he trusted, even though he never saw it with his eyes, that God was taking care of the spirit behind the spirit. Stand with me. Elijah walked in victory and power and authority, even though he never saw Jezebel defeated in his lifetime. He worked miracle after miracle after miracle. He was able to mentor Elisha, Elisha who received a double portion. Elijah was literally so close to God and so powerful in the spirit that Elijah did not die. He was translated into heaven in a fiery chariot. God literally came down and carried Elijah up into the heavens. That was the relationship that Elijah had with God. And the lesson that God has for us tonight, we're living in the last days and there are demons and spirits and things behind the scenes that we may not live to see be defeated. Why? Because we're living in the last days and God is not going to bring those things low because they are a part of what has been invited into the world. God's not going to kick spirits out of regions When the region wants those spirits. But what he will do. Is he will give you authority and power. To operate with all of that evil. You say but brother Ryan. We can't have the authority that we used to have. The age is so dark and it's so difficult. You can have the same authority. That anybody has ever had in the spirit. It doesn't matter what Jezebel is doing. It doesn't matter what Atlanta does. It doesn't matter what laws New York signs into place. It doesn't matter. You need to just stand up and say, if I'm a man of God, I'm going to call down fire from heaven. If I'm a woman of God, I'm going to pray down fire from heaven. I'm going to pray down fire over my home. I'm going to pray down fire in these altars. I'm going to pray down fire over my children, over my family. If there's somebody here tonight and you need a fresh touch of God, a fresh fire in your life, maybe you've seen victory in the past, but it's been a long time. I'm inviting you to get up and come to this altar as the first step. And I want you to lift up your hands and say, Lord, give me the confidence that I used to have. I had confidence against Ahab. I had confidence against Goliath, but Lord, there are things that I don't understand that are happening right now. I'm I'm fighting battles that I didn't think I'd have to fight. I, I thought that battle would be the last battle, but now I'm in a more difficult battle. Would you humble yourself and come? Elijah, would you come? Would you lift up your hands and say, Lord, I'm putting this battle in your hands. I'm gonna let you fight this battle because I can't do this by myself. If you feel to, would you take a brother or sister by the hand and say, will you be... Will you be the Elisha to my Elijah? Will you be the Elisha to my Elijah? Can we just bend together against the spirit of the age? Because we're not going to be able to defeat this spirit alone. We're going to do this together. Come on, pray for somebody. Pray for somebody. Unify your prayer. Unify your praise. Unify your dedication. Unify your faithfulness. That's it. That's it. I know you didn't think you'd have to fight that battle. But go ahead and give that battle to the Lord tonight. He's going to fight the battle for you. 
break He's every working chain, all things together for break good. Every chain, break every Vengeance chain. is mine, saith the Lord. There is power God knows the end of the story. God knows how it's going to happen. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Go ahead and get up. Don't let Jezebel take your praise. Don't let Jezebel take away your power. Don't let Jezebel rob you of your authority. Don't let Jezebel rob you of your confidence. Walk in boldness. Walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. There is power. 